Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center podcast. This is a roundtable digest discussion where we take the top articles from the last CS digest and we talk about them and how they matter in the world of technology and cybersecurity. If you're interested in subscribing to the Cybersecurity Digest, visit www.csiac.org forward slash CS Digest, where you can get a fully curated cybersecurity list of articles every two weeks. Uh, my name is Sean Bird. Mike Corley. And I'm Michael Van Seemerk. And first, we're going to talk about an article from the UK titled a british 15 year old gained access to intelligence operations in afghanistan and iran by pretending to be the head of the cia so a 15 year old pretended to be multiple u.s government officials a teenager impersonated john brennan the head of the cia mark giuliano fbi director or deputy director rather he also targeted u.s secretary of homeland security and barack obama's director of national intelligence as well as numerous other uh, systems as well as intelligence personnel over the course of eight months. The attacks allowed for the access of personal accounts and devices of the targets and their families. The attack, uh, the attacker claims that it was in support of anti-U.S. government agendas, and including some, I think, anti uh, anti-Israeli stances and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is by far, I think, the most intrusive intrusive use of social engineering that I can recall within the U.S. government and as a cyber attack. I think the security implement implications of, uh, of this are kind of huge, and this was done all by a 15-year-old, not even someone with any experience. So uh, it makes me think this, this could be really bad if it was someone with actual experience in the field. Right, like you said, it's definitely scary how personal this attack kind of was where he was calling up the wives and the family members of these people and harassing them after he got their personal details yeah it is interesting sean and and the idea that you mentioned of him being 15 years old and you know social engineering is really the 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 basis the, the the many forms of of ways that information systems are compromised and and it's interesting that uh, we think of social engineering as a general term, but there's so many uh, specifics when you get down to it, so many different techniques. Of course, there's phishing, which we're all familiar with, has to do with uh, you know getting someone to click on a malicious email link, and, and, and even variations on that. Spear phishing, where you're going to, and rather, rather than try to target a larger audience, you're going to uh, seek to target an individual based on some information about them. I think and that's most of the attacks we hear about are the phishing, the that's targeted what you hear phishing about. or the spear phishing attacks. This was just this was one, just calling. Well, this to be them. exactly. Yeah. Well, in particular, this particular strategy or technique is something that's referred to as pretexting. In 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 Britain, it's often referred to as blagging or bohoing, and it's generally uh, uh, this idea of creating a scenario or a sophisticated lie whereby you're able to convince somebody or uh, create the environment whereby they're willing to give you or divulge the information. And this, this young fellow did it pretty well. Yeah. So. It really reminds you how effective social engineering can be. Without having a super technical background, you can get in and compromise these systems. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which, and this, this was an inexperienced 15-year-old that got caught, which yeah. makes you think what kind of social engineering mm-hmm. is going on right now with high-ranking, you know, intelligence officials that yeah. we don't even know about or they don't even know about. Crazy. So so that raises the, the question that a lot of people might ask. What do you do about these things? What are some countermeasures? And uh, just a, a printout here, some of the, the standard mm. guidance is putting together a standard framework, establishing frameworks of trust between your employees and an interpersonal level, and training is a big deal. Uh, scrutinizing information identifying which information is sensitive and evaluating its exposure to social engineering and most certainly you know, security protocols establishing protocols and policies and procedures for handling sensitive information is something we're hearing more and more about but it's important that we do at an organizational and at an individual level and i think so, not using so much your personal information as even security questions and stuff like like what's, what's your first pet's name mm-hmm. and stuff. just make like really good security policy decisions exactly yeah yeah exactly so moving on, the next article that we wanted to, talk, wanted to talk about was tech giants and elected officials back Microsoft in Supreme Court case on international data privacy. 
There are many details of this court case, as it's a very large one. The main point of concern is whether or not law enforcement can gain access to the information and data of a foreign user when the data is hosted by a United States-based company on a server located on foreign soil. This ruling is very important because the future of the cloud, as previously passed laws, do not account for today's usage. So the, the use of the internet doesn't account for a, from, uh, a law from rather 1987 doesn't account for the way that the internet's used today. Uh, it's mainly an issue of like foreign law and jurisdiction, but I think it really mm-hmm. plays into, it, it's going to count as a precedent for how the cloud is handled in the future and how data is handled in the cloud. Mm-hmm. And it, it could affect, say, like the fight on global terrorism and stuff like that. If you mm-hmm. have, you know, a UK-based user with using a server in Germany, but the, it's a Microsoft US-based account, right. who has the information mm-hmm. and who owns it. Sure. And I think that's why you see these giant, like like the article says, these tech giants like Google and Microsoft fighting for this. It's because it's going to shape how the cloud pans out. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what's interesting, guys. What, you, what, you, what it boils down here to here, in, in a larger sense, is the interpretation of laws in their current form. The 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 um, SCA, or the the Communications Act, uh, is something. I think it was originally put out in 1986, but it didn't consider uh, borderless cloud storage. It didn't consider technology and the explosion of the internet as we know it today. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that the answer to this is really taking a second look from, you know, the perspective of, um, you know, those who formulate law and put it into policy is, is to reconsider these technologies and to really determine what makes sense, protecting the individual. Uh, it's interesting that 100, 289 individuals in 37 countries have... have uh, Illustrated or the the amicus briefs, as the article mm-hmm. talks about, have illustrated support. But it boils down to some real controversial issues: Is email the property of the provider, or is it the property of the property of the owner? And, mm-hmm. and and I certainly see it as the property of the owner. But the way these laws are interpreted and what, and what they country pertain to those laws are implemented, and yeah. whether it's a U.S. law or Germany law. Sure. I mean, we talked sure. a little bit about this this sort of topic on the last podcast on. Uh, like in the U.S., it's more of a thing to say, if you have nothing to hide, why yeah, are you right. hiding it? Yeah. But in Europe, it's data privacy is, is the norm. It's very highly regarded and respected. Yeah. So the, I think the laws are really blurry for in an international sense. You yeah. kinda, everybody yeah. has to come to an agreement on how these yeah. things are going to be treated. And that's yeah. one thing that wasn't really talked about. There's these laws called, or, uh, there's these things called mutual legal assistance treaties where countries will come together and agree to help one another out and uh, will provide data for law enforcement purposes if necessary. And uh, like the Republic of Ireland basically said, yeah, if we see one of those, we'll respond to it. But it's not mentioned in this article at all mm-hmm. or something. But. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I, th- I think the authorities in the case that they're talking about in this article didn't go through the normal means, uh, the, the normal channels like that would pertain to. And so I think that's that's mainly what this is is regarding is what happens when they just the government says just give me this information right. instead of going through that channel. Yeah. Because yep. Microsoft being in the U.S., they can just say, "Hey, you're right here. I know you can log into the your server across the, exactly. across the pond." Yeah. So. And then that brings up other issues. It's like, okay, what if they move that data and say, "Oh, well, we don't have that. That's way over in Ireland. Like, we don't yeah. store that here." Mm-hmm. It creates a lot of complexities yeah. that didn't exist at the time, and I think the Stored Communications Act, as it was passed in 1986, it didn't understand those things. So I think we're going to see some real changes to some of those laws and and, exactly. and and how they're subject to the interpretation that they are. Yeah. Yep. Good thing to look out for. Mm-hmm. So moving on, uh, the next article is Cisco rolls out a solution to te- to detect malware in encrypted network traffic. So this is from Bleeping Computer, and, and it mainly describes Cisco uh, has released a feature in a lot of their, their new devices that is called the encrypted traffic analytics part of their new devices, and it identifies malware inside of network traffic that is encrypted without the need for decrypting the data. Now, this is done through a process of machine learning and in an analysis of traffic behavior. Now, I thought this was pretty 
interesting because obviously it's encrypted. You can't see inside the packet. So what were they using yeah. to identify this type of this type of malware? Was it like a heuristics type of thing? Yeah, yes. it is largely yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they were looking at like the first packet that goes across, which is unencrypted, and then like the packet lengths so, and the times that the packets were going out. Mm-hmm. So to kind of figure out, okay, is this malicious? And trying to build like a profile of normal traffic. Yeah. Right, it's it like an anomaly of... detection type. Yeah, which made me think, so what kind of false positives were they getting? So mm-hmm. how can you identify or distinguish between normal network latency and like a man-in-the-middle attack because it's go- it has to make an extra bounce mm-hmm. or, or something like that? What, what mm-hmm. types of problems are they going to catch? Right. Well, it's interesting, Sean, because traditional flow modeling provides a high-level view of the network communications by reporting the addresses, the ports, the byte and packet counts. But what they're taking into consideration here is the inner flow metadata and information about the events that occur within a flow. And these can be collected, stored, and analyzed within a, in a flow monitoring framework. And they're taking these things and they're utilizing them in this capacity. And this interflow metadata is what they're calling the uh, encrypted traffic analytics or the ETA. Mm-hmm. So like you indicate, they don't have to uh, you know, on the fly uh, decrypt the stream. Or In fact, they're, they're using this uh, information about the stream, this additional layer of metadata, to do this heuristic-based kind of a thing that you're yeah. referring to. Yeah. I still don't think they can catch anything that's in an application, like an application-based vulnerability. Like that's not what they're trying to detect no. here. No. It's it, mainly just network right. uh, attacks and network vulnerabilities. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, there's there are even I'm not up on all the laws, but there are laws in terms of what you can look into, how much of the payload yeah. that you can look into, mm-hmm. and, and 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 you can't. There's a lot of data regulations saying mm-hmm. what you can and can't, and yeah. that's where things get messy. Is yeah, that's where this will help out because you're not decrypting the traffic. Mm-hmm. So, very interesting. Yep. Yeah, it's something to look at in the future. I, I don't believe it's in any. It's not going to be in any current Cisco devices. It's something that people are going to have to buy into as they upgrade their Cisco devices. And I'm also interested to see what other what vendors other vendors come up with right. it, to compete with this sort of thing and in this sort of feature. Whether we'll see some kind of knockoffs or something like that, something that says it does it but doesn't. Who knows? We'll see the adoption rate and how well that they're they've added this to a number of their product lines, and we'll see yeah. how well those do. Be interesting to see. what they catch. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Be interesting. So coming up next, a uh, simple sticker trick neural networks into classifying anything as a toaster. This is a little bit more fun and lighthearted than, than some other articles, but Google researchers have created a sticker that will trick image recognition software into thinking every picture of an object is a toaster. This is done through using images that are much more quote unquote salient or prominent in identifiable features to the software. So what came to first what first came to mind for me is something like Amazon Go where they have a Amazon Go if you're not familiar it, it's a shop that they just started I think out in Seattle and it's supposed to be cashierless so you just walk oh, in okay you grab your bag it it identifies you I think based on your phone or something like that and when you go around the store picking up items and putting them into your bag it's using image recognition software mm-hmm. to right. see what you pick up and, and put it in the bag and charge it for you when you walk out of charge yep. it to your account when you walk out of the store. So I'm I'm thinking, well, if I have a sticker on the back of my hand, that's right, yep. it, that says everything's a banana. Yeah, and, and I go up and I start grabbing yogurts you, you and you just bought a whole load of bananas. I yeah. just bought yeah. you know three dozen bananas yeah. and no one's the wiser. Yeah, and I other technology I think is relying on this. Say like Tesla. Mm-hmm. is relying for their automated driving. This is all image recognition oh, software yeah. to cool. identify cars and road signs and what have you. Right. So say someone puts one of these stickers uh, that it doesn't have to be a toaster, obviously, but exactly. would identify a car that's on a bike or something, something to, to trick it. Or a stop sign. or a, Yeah, they yeah. overlay sign, it with a stop like sign or something like that, and it just freaks these systems out. What kind of attacks mm-hmm. And little malicious things that we're going to see out there. That's right. And I think it, uh, depending on the domain, it becomes uh, very, very critical. If you're doing speech recognition or OCRing type things, depending on the domain that you're in, it can become important. Certainly with the self-driving cars, it mm-hmm. becomes really critical. 
And I, I think we're going to see more and more of this machine to machine or algorithm to algorithm type competition that comes up in terms of who can defeat who. And it's just going to be a game that continues yeah. to progress as these technologies uh, evolve and mature. Hopefully we don't, recognize, yeah. or we don't rely on it too much. Uh, it, these critical systems that could exist yeah. that would rely on this sort of... T- I can't think of any that are like super well, critical other than the car driving. I sure, sure shouldn't want it to make a decision for me without my input, <laughs> yeah. you know? So. Also, so that like, came to mind is augmented... Re- sorry, uh, but augmented reality is... I'm sure augmented reality like Google Glass or something mm-hmm. like that uses the image recognition to identify pieces. Exactly. And stuff mm-hmm. like user authentication and stuff yeah. like that. It's mm-hmm. like, oh... That's right. You're not so and so. You're somebody else because all of a sudden you're tricking the camera into thinking that you're a completely different person. I didn't mm-hmm. think about it. So like a biometric security scan or something mm-hmm. like that. Yep. Sure. Crazy. I, yeah, it is interesting stuff. So that kind of wraps up what we had for today. Again, if you'd like to subscribe to the CS Digest, visit www.csiac.org forward slash CS Digest, and you can subscribe to all to the list of articles that we talked. You can see the articles that we talked about today as well as some references, references, but you can as well subscribe to the mailing list and get this list of articles uh, that we deem important and more every two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Did you know that CSIAC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up. Visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars 